grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. No one, no one likes to live involved in conflicts with other people. If it's possible, we avoid them. And according to the Apostle Paul's recommendation, who said in Romans chapter 12, as far as you are concerned, live in peace with all. On the other hand, conflicts are part of our lives. Sometimes we cannot avoid them or escape from them. If one is seriously wronged, one cannot remain indifferent. Or if someone raises slander against us, how can we not react? There are situations where we cannot back away from conflict. On the other hand, there are also spaces in which we seek shelter at times when we are experiencing situations of conflict. Spaces such as our family and our church. These two institutions, according to research, still enjoy the confidence of many people. The family, in its various forms, is the group in which people most trust. The churches, as spaces of communion and mutual love between sisters and brothers, also exert influence over people. Maybe not quite as much as in the past, but they do. Family and church, for the most part, still constitute welcoming and trusting havens and provide some stability in the midst of many conflicts which life surrounds us. What happens, however, when we are in conflict with our family or with our church? Jesus experienced something like this in his ministry. The gospel writer Mark presents Jesus to us in a situation in which he faces a conflict both with family members and with the scribes from his church, that is, those who interpreted scripture. The beginning of the gospel, according to Mark, shows us Jesus performing many cures, contradicting precepts, and teaching in order to attract the attention of many people. We read in chapter 1, Jesus walked throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. And so now we hear that a crowd is after him and wants to see and experience for themselves what they have heard about him. The disciples, we hear, hardly have time to eat. He himself has to retire and leave early in the after dawn in order not to be seen and in order to find the time and place to pray. Into this situation, his relatives attempt to stage something of an intervention. The word is about that Jesus is crazy, beside himself, out of his mind. He has bats in his belfry. He's not behaving like a sane man. The family, his family, space of welcome and security, they want to protect him by removing him from the situation in which he's arrived. They want to take him home. They want to get back their sensible, level-headed, sane son and brother. They feel he could regain the judgment he used to have before people started saying he was Looney Tunes. Jesus does not appreciate their attempted intervention. He discounts and he resists their actions. He says they are a diversion from his mission to proclaim the kingdom of God. Not an attempt to protect him at all from embarrassment or even worse. He sees his family in this moment in a new light. He sees they do not understand his purposes, at least 
in that moment. And so he seeks support in a larger circle of those who do the will of God. I want to be clear, though, that Jesus isn't diminishing the importance of families. What this passage teaches is that even the family, when it contradicts the gospel, what the gospel proposes, the family should not be used to hold priority over our mission to live as God's people and according to God's will. The family is given to us and intended for us to be a space of security and warmth. We know in some cases that it is in precisely the family space that many children and women suffer violence and the exact opposite of security and warmth. Wherever the family is an institution, in those cases and in others, wherever the family is an institution that keeps us from embracing the life God intends for us and keeps us from committing ourselves to the gospel of Jesus, then it needs to be questioned. But in the intended, God-led and god following family. The love that we share there serves as an inspiration for the love we are called to experience in our relationships with fellow believers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, my mother. In today's reading, we hear also that Jesus' family of faith attempts to intervene in his mission. The religious power, represented by the synagogues where Jesus taught, attempts to discredit Jesus' actions. He has Beazable, and by that ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. They aren't just saying he's gone out of his mind, like his family said. They are saying He is possessed, and not by God's Holy Spirit, to be clear. Jesus doesn't just brush them off like he seems to do with his family. Rather, he takes time to invite them to reflect upon what they're saying. How do you imagine that Beazabal could be fighting against his own commanders? Isn't that unsensible, he's saying to them? This is not likely what you're meaning to say, is it? If he casts out the demons and looses people from what is evil, it's because Satan has already been immobilized, as we sang in our hymn. And so Jesus says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. To bind and immobilize evil is the action of the Spirit of God. Jesus is showing he is indeed possessed. He's possessed by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And he is claiming that possession here. Mark wants to let everyone know this, so he records this in his Gospel. To confuse the act of the Spirit of God with the action of Beazabal, or Satan, is sin. It is sin without forgiveness. It's so unimaginable. That's what that means. This is a conflict with the established religion, and Jesus cannot avoid it. To confuse the signs of the presence of the kingdom of God with the signs of the forces that oppose it cannot be left unanswered. In Jesus, the forces of the heavens are made manifest. He brings the kingdom of God near to us. His presence assures us that God is with us. Where the spirit of Christ is present, there is freedom, truth, a willingness to serve, a welcome, warmth, security, justice, and even peace. And without exception, evil must retreat. In this gospel reading, we are invited to discern how do we find that which promotes life 
in the midst of the structures and the institutions that bind us, and where even we sometimes do not recognize the power of Jesus. We shouldn't run away from our own responsibility in this discernment. As we heard in the third chapter of Genesis, when caught in a crime, Adam blames Eve. She blames the serpent, right? No one takes responsibility. Others are always responsible for the wrong done. We're familiar with this. But in Jesus is the power to deliver us also from the evils that even we practice and afflict. There is forgiveness. There is new life. There is salvation. Conflicts are part of our lives. Facing them, we are strengthened to recreate spaces, to transform reality, and to announce life. In the midst of conflicts and afflictions, we are encouraged by a promise that announces a new reality, a new house, as we heard, a new house not made by human hands. May we be blessed in the communion of people who are guided by the will of God and in the spaces opened up by the action of the Spirit of God who overcomes evil. The peace of God, which is greater than our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.